Well, hello everyone. I'm Bridget Ayer here and uh, here for another edition of All About the Grace. And on this channel, we talk about faith, culture, and media awareness. And I have a, a return guest, one of my favorite people, Timothy O'Donnell. So welcome to All About the Grace, Timothy. Well, it is terrific to be back with you, Bridget. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, just delighted to be here. And uh, Timothy, he is the co-host for the Catholic Cave on Catholic Radio Indy, and uh, many people know him as the caveman or one of the cavemen over there. So uh, you can, I don't see any clubs in the back there, no, though. No, no, no. I'm not as maybe as furry as maybe more traditional cavemen. Kind of. Yeah, but but you got you got the weapon Mary back there on the shelf. I do. So that's good. Yeah, that's, that's good. right. That's lots right. of that's lots of prayer Mary. books too. So you have a background in ethics and theology, yes. and you're an engineer by trade, and you're working on your PhD, and you work in financial services, and you, you're a, a, gosh, you're a pro-life advocate, and you teach religious ed, and you teach at Ivy Tech and Butler Ethics. Mm -hmm. Did I cover it all? I think you covered it all, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually teach ethics and philosophy, <laughs> Um, some of those related courses at uh, at Ivy Tech, and then uh, Butler. I actually teach a business course in their MBA program. Oh wow! Well, that's really cool. I didn't I didn't know that you were doing. I, I learned something new every time I talk to you, Tim. <laughs> well, I got to keep moving, Bridge. I got to stay a step ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell me about it. I, I don't want people. I don't want my you know my uh, naysayers to catch up to me. <laughs> oh, gotcha, gotcha. Well, today we're going to be talking about um, the human person and technology. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on artificial intelligence, which is, um, so the last 10 years was digital media and social media, which kind of really changed the landscape of media. But going forward in the next 10 years, really everything's going to be AI, artificial intelligence. So, um, Tim, what, how would you define artificial intelligence? Yeah, artificial intelligence, I think, um, a, a really good way to get a, a handle on it is uh, sometimes called machine intelligence. Was, we're referring to uh, uh, man-made, man-made, human-made device, you know, a computer, an extremely sophisticated computer software that um, seems to exhibit at least two qualities that are that have really only been that are really uh, exemplary in human beings, uh, namely learning and problem solving. So when you see a computer or computer environment, a digital environment where it's where it's displaying an ability to learn or problem solve on its own, it's suggestive of artificial intelligence, or that's what most people mean by artificial intelligence or machine intelligence. That the machine now isn't just capable, but it's it's it seems to be exhibiting some sort of cognitive ability of its own, or at least so sophisticated a set of responses that one would, one would think that's what's going on. Well, if you think about back in the day, and this was before everyone had a PC in their house, the thought- I, I was that, around then. <laughs> yeah, the thought that, that people would have a PC in their house was just nuts. You know, when someone said, oh yeah, was it Bill Gates or one of them said, you know, had the vision that everyone would have that in their house and now we all do now in the next 10 years are we all going to have robots in our house i mean i guess we all have the the i bought <laughs> robot uh cleaner you know and then we've got I definitely had one of those for the floor i yeah. called it jennifer <laughs> yeah oh yeah and then we've got the you know the echo dot which you know and you've got all these different technologies i mean are we going to have robots in our house uh, I would think that that's a, uh, yeah, for, for some people, maybe even most people that's, that's on, that's on the horizon and not a very distant horizon. And I think to, to, to something you were uh, just mentioning, Bridget, is we, we're already, uh, immersed in artificial intelligence already, smartphones, um, internet, um, and then smart devices like, uh, echoes and things like that already. In fact, the, the, uh, commercial, the entire commercial sphere and others um, are just uh, soaked in artificial intelligence in a way that we were really unaware of and and uh, and really can't really can't escape can't get out of. And, and so, so 
what I want to talk about as we talk about artificial intelligence is talk about it from a Catholic perspective and why, why it can be potentially bad. Not that, you know, the Catholic church has never said that science is bad. You know, that it's not like morality is good and science is bad. Um, the church doesn't teach, you know, science is bad or anything. I think, I think the church has gotten a bad it's rap. like the opposite, really. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Faith and science are, are, are completely compatible because they both should have as their object truth. Their proper object is, should help us arrive at the truth. And there's, there aren't multiple truths. There's, one, there's ultimately one truth, and that's, that's Christ. Yeah. So talk about um, the value of the human person and the Catholic teaching of the dignity of the human person and, and how um, artificial intelligence could potentially supplant the um, dignity of the human person. I know that's a big question, but. Sure, yeah, that's a, but that's a great place to start really is the dignity of the human person because that's gonna give us the reason why we ought to care about where te technology or uh, the use of technology uh, by us or on us or for us or on behalf is so important, such an important set of questions. Um, so why do we care? Well, it, here, I, here I would um, just make a quick reference to uh, the, the catechism of the Catholic Church and really the, the topic or the, the subject of the dignity of the human person really begins with uh, paragraph 1700. And I'll, uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to paraphrase that a little bit, but the, the dignity of the human person really is rooted in the fact that we have been created, every human being has been created in the image and likeness of God, and that our vocation, all of the, the, the in the broadest sense of the term, and, and maybe the most important sense of the term, our vocation is beatitude, or to be with God forever in heaven. That's what we, that's our ultimate purpose. Um, and then it's up to us in this life, every human being, that we need to be free to direct ourselves, our actions, uh, towards fulfilling God's that fulfilling God's plan, moving towards beatitude. What does that mean? Well, for it means growing in virtue and holiness, um, and it means that when we uh, in avoiding sin, but when we sin, we uh, reconcile with God. And for Catholics, that's and that's going to mean. Um, availing ourselves of the sacrament of, of confession, amending our, our lives and picking ourselves up. But uh, so, so that's why every human being uh, is endowed with an immortal soul. So we're, we're and it was either Chesterton or Lewis, um, as I recall reading, you know, said, you know, we're, we're really built to last. We're built to last forever <laughs> from the <laughs> once we're, once we come into existence, the soul's immortal. So that is, uh, we have to keep that in mind. And so there's a certain indestructibleness about each human person. And because God calls us out of love to himself, every person we meet, we have to, we have to be, we should remind ourselves that uh, God loves them and God wants them to be in, in heaven with them for all eternity. And so that's what we, we should be doing. Them. And that's why our primary concern as Catholics is always about what, our primary concern is about what the salvation of souls, right? Our own soul and then the souls of others. So let's talk a little bit about surveillance capital. And there, there's a book by that title. Talk about that book and what the meaning is behind that. What is that, that term? Oh, sure. So um, just to kind of get us going, the term surveillance capital is not my own. Um, it comes from, a, uh, I'm glad you mentioned it comes from a book, um, and uh, she is a professor. She might have just actually kind of retired, uh, but she was a professor. Her name is Shoshona Zuboff um, at uh, Harvard, and she taught in the, their business school, and she wrote a book that came out in January of 2019. I, I think that's about right, and it's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, the fight for human future, uh, for a, uh, the fight for a human future uh, at uh, the uh, new frontier of power. And uh, it's a fascinating book because um, she, it's one way for us to engage in um, this discussion of artificial intelligence and 
how it's how it's uh, being used in ways that I think most people that are watching uh, probably are, are unaware of. And, and let me give you, a, if, if it's helpful to me, illustrate just a quick point of yeah. to open it up. And the example would be something like this. We, you may recall, uh, I don't know, maybe you even did. Let me ask you, Bert, did you ever play Pokemon Go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I haven't, but my kids have, so I'm familiar with it, yeah. Okay, so... Pokemon Go, right, is a, uh, I'm, not, I'm not directly a participant myself, but Pokemon Go, generally it's an out, outdoor game. Um, you engage with the game and it sends you around uh, different parts of the town, neighborhoods, things like that, where you collect uh, virtual digital kind of objects. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how you advance in the game. You get points, things like that. So it's, it's fun. It, it, it's group activity. It's got, uh, it's entertaining. You get outdoors or, you know, a little exercise, so, so to speak. Well, what people don't realize, for example, this is where uh, surveillance capitalism comes in. What people don't realize is that in a game like Pokemon Go, and this is an example from Dr. Uh, Zuboff's book, in a game like Pokemon Go, what's happened is the game manufacturer has uh, entered into a contract with uh, a fast food chain um, that, and the fast food chain um, of course, wants you to come visit and buy some of their delicious food. So uh, what they've done is they've contracted with, say, Nintendo and said, okay, Nintendo, while you're building this game, one of the things we want you to do is at a certain point in the game, say a half hour into it, 45 minutes into an hour into it, when people, when they have a good reason to believe that people would begin to be getting hungry, have place the object, place an object near our restaurant. Mm. And so, and that's what happens. And so they have good reason. They're, they're scraping lots and lots of data from us. We'll get more into that if you like. And they understand on a macro scale that human beings, by virtue of us having kind of a shared uh, culture, shared human nature, um, that we're, we, we can be prone to doing, groups of us can be prone to doing similar things under s similar promptings. And so they've got enough data to realize that, hey, we can be herded into something like a Taco Bell un completely unknowingly. And that is being orchestrated all behind the scenes behind us. And I, I know at this point, sometimes someone maybe watching will go, well, T Tim, where's your tinfoil hat? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you better get like a double X. That's a big melon uh, to, to get your tinfoil hat on. But it's, it's not, it's really, again, more of a, it's not, it's not a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. No, it, but it is a coordinated effort, commercial effort, right? Of, of supply and demand and trying to move consumers towards one's products and services that are for sale. Uh, but uh, so that's just a, that's just one kind of just very, very rudimentary instance where um, we're being led unknowingly towards economic, specific economic outcomes that may or not, that really don't have us in mind per se. They don't care about you, Bridget, and they don't care about me. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're what I call identity zero. In other words, in, in the sense of, in, the, in relation to surveillance capitalism, those entities don't care about us as, as people, as individuals. They don't care that we have dignity, that we have an immoral soul. All those things we began the program with describing from the catechism what our, our true purpose is and why we were created. That's, that's a, we're literally, bet, we're being reduced to, reduced to raw material, raw material, that they can, uh, that can be, that provides data that can be fed into gigantic, uh, or I, gigantic is kind of the wrong way to think of it, um, the wrong term to use. It's more extremely sophisticated uh, computer algorithms that then create highly accurate predictive models. And what these models, uh, uh, what these models do is they inform uh, they inform the powers that be, and I'll, and I'll describe the, say the owner, who's, who would that be? Well, the Google and Facebook is who Zuboff names. They're the biggest, uh, perhaps, uh, 
aggregators and, and users of this kind of uh, surveillance capitalism. And what they do is they'll, they'll, they'll use that data to be, they'll be able to, to tell what we're going to do now, soon, and later. And so they're just basic terms. So these predictive models are, uh, are created through these algorithms by scraping our data. And where's our data coming from? It's coming from what we're doing right now. It because this is going over the internet. This is a uh, this is available for for others to uh, take data, uh, extract data from it. It's from our it's from our smartphones mm -hmm. all the time. It's from anything that we're having any type of right any type of interaction with uh, digitally. We're producing all kinds of data, and that data can become again. You don't have to be a hundred percent. You just have to, you, what, you have, what you do if you're a Google is you create these predictive models and then you can, and they literally there are pools that they're then traded. Uh, these are, it's commoditized. And then these predictive models are then traded between aggregators like Facebook, Google, with lots and lots and lots of other entities who are interested in, again, achieving certain desired outcomes in the economic sphere. That's going to be us. Uh, you know, uh, engaging in, in some sort of sales of or exchange for products and services. Well, one thing that you had mentioned, because we've, we've talked about this before, and I know we did a show for Catholic Radio Indy on this topic. And one thing you mentioned, which I want to go back to, is something that the difference between this kind of, I guess, marketing, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. then your, just your typical commercial is the typical commercial you see the product, you know you're being sold a product. They might be funny, you know, whether it's Geico or Affleck or whatever, you know. Um, it, it might be entertaining, yes, but you know what the product is. How is this different? How, sure. is, this kind of, um, how is this kind of marketing or covert marketing different than mm -hmm. the other type? It, this is surveillance capitalism is far closer to, it's akin to an, a more sophisticated version, I would argue, than the uh, subliminal messaging that had emerged in early television, um, early film. Um, you, may re you may recall, you were too young, you probably weren't even born yet, Bridget, but in the, in the early 70s, there mm -hmm. was a congressional inquiry panel um, uh, in, into subliminal messaging I think it was even um, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, I think might even chair, chaired it. And um, what they were looking into was this notion that, uh, or a practice, I should say, it wasn't just an idea that actually, actually was happening, that um, during, that uh, certain messages um, were being embedded in uh, commercials, or they were commercials themselves, but embedded in uh, films and uh, television shows in order to manipulate us into doing something, mm -hmm. into say craving something, and then taking action on it, and what they were, what the reason why that worked is that uh, you know again at the time using state of the art uh, uh, scientific knowledge and technique, they came they uh, they realized that you know our eyes take in images at a certain speed, um, our brains then receive those images and process them and and take all these images to make a whole, and that there's little slivers of opportunities that they could sneak in something that um, would, our brain would sort of subconsciously pick up on, and then, but our, the forefront of our cognition would be, would completely miss. And so what the, 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 the quintessential example that you heard would be you're at, you're, they're running the previews uh, at a, uh, the trailers, we call them now, uh -huh. at a theater, and they slip in what? Uh, things for what? Concessions, popcorn. popcorn. And you don't even know what's going on. Um, and, they're, and then next thing you're sitting, man, man, I want some popcorn. I know, isn't that the truth? soda. <laughs> but you don't recoup. You haven't seen, you have no co conscious recollection of so having seen the advertisement. Mm -hmm. That's designed to, but it was there, nevertheless. So there's a kind of taking advantage of us, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so that practice was what? Banned. So is this, 
Okay, what is liquid modernity? Modernity, liquid modernity. What's okay, that? That's, okay, so, um, well. Did I, did I go backwards or did I? No, liquid modernity is a good one to, to bring up. Um, so liquid modernity is a term, it's not my term, it's a term used in philosophy, uh, sometimes in sociology and psychology. And what liquid modernity means is, is a, it's an attempt at um, describing our current setting. Sometimes we've heard um, modern times, sometimes if you go in certain circles, we're in a postmodern era. Mm -hmm. Well, liquid modernity is another term that says, well, actually something else is going on. Um, and what it's pointing to is this. Uh, I think the single best way to think about liquid modernity, its definition is, it's describing a constant state of chaotic flux such that our condition as human being is really going through life as sort of nomads mm. or even tourists in our own life. And so what I mean by that or what the term, what that, what's that suggestive of is this, we no longer plant roots, deep roots. We don't, uh, we don't, we tend not to embrace. So think about the culture more broadly. We shun traditions. Um, we change jobs all the time. We, we're quick to relocate. We're quick to, ch we have to embrace change. We get change management classes all the time because things change, 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 change. And that's what liquid modernity means. It means that we're untethered from what had been deeper roots. Now as Catholics, we probably don't sense liquid modernity quite as much because Catholics, we're plugged into a 2,000 plus year old institution, right? That, and so we feel there's a certain, there's a long tradition there that we're plugged into, right? But that's not the case for much of the world, certainly much of Western civilization. They're far more nomadic. They're far more of a, again, a, a sort of tourist in their own life. They're not, they're not uh, planting deep roots and uh, building around that. They're not uh, joining. They're not. Uh, there's a lack of permanence in favor of flux and change, and the result of that is a kind of uh, results in a kind of a constant anxiety and fear because everything you can't you can't really rest mm -hmm. in any sort of permanent uh, in any assurances that a permanence kind of that permanence gives you because uh, your constant things are constantly on the move. Yeah, no stability. So does that lead us into Catholic realization? Well, it, it'll lead us into something that, uh, yeah, the Catholic Church offers, I would say, a kind of antidote, um, and that is uh, Catholic, uh, I would call it Catholic realism. Okay. And Catholic realism would is uh, points to this. Um, we understand that and believe for good reasons. I don't just like say believe like blind faith. Catholic, we always have good reasons. Now we, we may have to investigate them, but we have good reasons. We believe that God made everything, right? God made the universe. And when he made the universe, he made, made the universe with, with a purpose and purpose is built into things. And that God is also what? He governs the universe, right? He, mm -hmm. is, he is divine providence. Um, Catholic, so reality is, means that there is something, of, there's, a, there's something objective outside of myself that I can know and come in contact with through sense data. So using my five senses, I see things, I hear things, smell things, taste, touch. Those are reliable ways. Now, it's not that we can't be tricked or deceived, but they're generally reliable ways for us to come in contact with an objective outside world. In other words, we reject the idea that we're just brains in a vat, or maybe a more modern version of that, that was depicted really well in movies, and they, they did uh, um, uh, three of them. If you uh, remember the red pill, blue pill, um, do you remember that with uh, uh, Keanu Reeves? Well, but the, Go ahead. but we're, not, uh, we're not simply, um, uh, reality is something that we can come in contact with, we can know, we can trust and move. 
Um, that's different from another, it's also different from what, like a thinker like Immanuel Kant, that um, uh, it, it, avoids, it avoids this. It avoids um, like severe skepticism that, there, that uh, a severe skeptic would say, I can't really trust, um, I can't really trust what I see, hear, think. Um, tomorrow the sun may not rise. Um, and so Catholic realism is a kind of antidote to this uh, nomad tourism that we see that liquid modernity is pointing to. Okay, what about, let's go back to personalism and what that means and why, why artificial technology could be a threat to personalism. Sure, uh, personalism is a philosophical school. It uh, uh, really began to emerge in the early 20th century with Edmund Husserl, um, who had a very famous, for Catholics especially, uh, had several really important students, one of which was Edith Stein, who became St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. She was an, an excellent, excellent uh, philosopher in her own right, and then of course became a uh, Catholic Carmelite nun, uh, per, a German, persecuted by the uh, Nazis, uh, chased out of Germany to Holland. Uh, eventually the, uh, the Nazis took over Holland and uh, she was uh, sent to Auschwitz where she was killed. Um, Husserl started what's called personalism. It's picked up uh, in a very particular way by St. John Paul the Great, St. John Paul II. Um, and there's, uh, it also traces its root back even prior to Husserl, who really puts a system around it, um, a formal philosophical system, to St. John Henry Cardinal Newman, that uh, probably certainly one of the, the, the towering figures of the 19th century um, in terms of uh, the, just Western civilization, Catholic Church, uh, but just in, intellectual prowess and contributions. And what personalism is, is pointing to is it, re it reminds us of the dignity of the human person, um, that relationships are always interpersonal, and the primacy uh, that the person plays in things like intentionality, um, morality, um, transcendence, especially when you think of like the good, the true, and the beautiful, and our desires to acquire those things. And it provides um, a, a kind of, it's a kind of antidote to the dehumanizing effect of surveillance capitalism. And let me tell you why the, uh, secular, uh, uh, um, surveillance capitalism is dehumanizing and a threat. Um, and the reason that is, is that surveillance capitalism, what a, what a Facebook and a Google are doing is they are turning human beings into raw material um, from which, right, they're, quite, they're pulling, they're scraping data and they're taking data that really in a certain, and, and again, creating these predictive models that are then sold um, and traded in uh, for uh, exchange and at some point presumably, you know, for, for business or commercial ends. Uh, which, which is Catholics, of course, business, commerce are, are perfectly good, reasonable things to engage in. However, what, they, what surveillance capitalism, uh, one of its dehumanizing effects is, it's making use of things, one, without your explicit consent. So in a way that you can't ever like fully consent to because there's no exit from the economic sphere of which we find ourselves in. What do we mean by that? Well, Bridget, I happen to know you're married. And I happen I'm to know get you rid of my phone, right? That's right. And so the, the text messaging um, it, it, between you and your husband or you and your kids, it can be deeply personal, right? It's really not for other people's eyes or consumption. And yet it, 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 that's what exactly is happening with it, right? there's a kind of violation of our most intimate being that's happening with surveillance capitalism because all of that data 
Um, all those things, those very deeply personal things are all being fed into a giant AI um, algorithm um, that is then being, again, turned into predictive models that are then being used to what? Uh, hurt us, uh, manipulate us, prompt us into doing things that we might not otherwise do. And it's in a way that, that we're not aware of. And so that we don't even know what's happening. So when you're playing Pokemon Go, you don't know that you're being herded towards a Burger King, but you are. Um, and the other thing is you don't know for, and there's no escape. Why? Well, there's no such, there's no such place in America where, where for any practical, re, in any practical way, for any substantial number of us to go off the grid. Yeah. Right? You, you can't just go, none of us can just pick up and just like head for the woods in Montana and live off the land, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and care for ourselves or others. It just can't happen. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we have to use, for, to, just to sustain um, uh, where, where we're at in, the, in, in, this, in this setting we find ourselves born into, we have to have uh, access and make use of technology. All of all this technology though, is feeding into this surveillance capitalism. So that's what I mean. There's there's no getting around it. There's no there's no going back um, to a, a state of affairs that doesn't include mo a lot of what uh, contemporary or, or very modern technology as part of our lives. So, so, so you can't get out of it. So what should we do since we can't get out of it? What sh unless we're heading to the hills. <laughs> Right, which would get, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know if I can live off the land. I, I just don't know. I don't see myself like chopping down trees and building a log cabin. I think those, I, I would have had to start it like 30 years ago oh if that God. was going to be in the cards for me. Plus, so, like, you know, how many of us could do it, you know? Right. Zero, zero, one percent of Americans are really in a, you know, a, a way it could actually try something like that. No, so it can't happen. So, well, I think it has to, it has to do with something, it has to do with what, we as the uh, the citizens, the consumers, what sort of uh, what sort of demands that we want to place um, on um, and expectations that we have around uh, this data collection and how it's being used. Um, right now, we don't have any way to know and have it. We have no way to access what a Google or Facebook uh, could or would be doing with um, the data and ways that we're being heard. So I would say the first thing would be a call for some sort of transparency um, in, in terms of, and I don't mean like extending like terms of service again and th that nobody reads, right? That, uh, you know, we sign up. So that's the thing. We sign up for like, like Facebook is free. We think it's free because we're not getting a bill the same way our gas company or electric company sends us a bill every month or cable bill sends up. So it seems free. Well, it's not free at all because what we're giving up is we're giving up lots and lots and lots of data to them that's valuable. Now, it may not be valuable to me. It might not be uh, easy for me to turn my, my data into a commercial enterprise, but it is when we're all doing it together, it is for Google and Facebook to do it, to turn it into So they are getting a lot of it. So we are giving, there is an exchange. It's not free. Um, so we need, I would say the first thing is we need to, a better understanding of like what's being done. So transparency, once we know what's being done, then we could see whether or not it would make sense to, to have some sort of guardrails or consumer protection. Maybe it looks like, you know, it's been a long time since the mid seventies, but maybe there, maybe there are some things that, that are prohibitive. It's just highly problematic to me. It, it just, and this is just me talking. It's highly problematic to me to have, uh, you know, large, powerful institutions that are engaged in, in systematic dehumanization of persons, uh, that can end well for us, right? And with, the, with their goal, you know, again, intentionally hurting, manipulating us, using us as raw material for uh, ends and means that we have no idea what they are. We have no idea what they're, wh where, what are they hurting us towards? And for what reasons? Well, we don't know. <laughs> You know, we don't know. I'd like to know. And then we might need to, then we'd be able to do something about it, perhaps. Right. And it, it doesn't seem like there's any oversight of those companies. Um, that's another, yeah. I mean, 
Well, and the government could be another problem too. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> you know, the, who knows what they're doing with the data? Yeah, you, you don't got, know what they're doing either. You know, but yet you have to start somewhere. I mean, you got to trust someone to get the thing started. Right. So, I, I, you know, the government should be buying for the people, but I get where there's issues with that because of you know WikiLeaks I incidents, you know, with the NSA and stuff like that. There seem to be uh, all kinds of data collection that's going on, and we're not we're really not sure for what purpose. I mean. One of the one, one, here's one, one quick example where data collection, I think, is a mixed bag. Um, and this, this, happen, this happens uh, in the, right, right now today in America and other Western countries. So let's say, uh, let's say uh, you know, a crime's been committed. Someone, uh, ha, you know, at a certain time of day, uh, on a certain street corner, uh, they get mugged, they get hurt, they get robbed, and the assailant runs off. And there's really no good description. You know, they got them from behind. There's no, they don't, the victim really doesn't know who did it and doesn't have a good description. Well, what law enforcement can and, can and uh, is successful doing is they can go to a judge and get a warrant issued to go to that they will then present to cell phone carriers. Um, and then the cell phone was specific. You now there's constraints, but there's specific they will get from the cell phone carriers for that specific date and time. Uh, a listing of, well, which cell phones were in that area when this crime happened, and that, that gives them a list of potential suspects, right? So think about that. So you, you might have been, and I know you would never commit any crime, but you, what if you were in the area, Bridget, and you're just kind of walking, this is why it's mi mixed, you're, you just happen to be in that area, you have no idea what, you don't even know that thing had, that crime happened, right. you're on a list and you might actually be approached by law enforcement, who knows? Um, that, that would be kind of unsettling. Um, and the other hand, though, you, you do want to solve the crime, um, and but it seems like there. So there's lots of different ways this data could be used, um, and uh, uh, it's just something we're we're going to have to really think through and decide. Um, I guess as a as a community, society, as a people, like how far you have to balance. You know, liberty sometimes has to be balanced with personal liberty with the common good. And that's not always an easy balance to strike. And the technology is moving so quickly, way faster than, you know, the public policy or even the acknowledgement that, that these problems could ex exist, you know, even the awareness of that. I want, before I run out of time, I want you to give our audience um, a couple of resources that, um, one, the, the book that you mentioned, and then there's another um, Catholic resource that would be valuable in this discussion for people that want further information about it. Yeah, so the two, yeah, thank you, Bridget. The two places to start would be um, Shoshona Zuboff's book, The Professor of Business uh, from Harvard, uh, Surveillance Capitalism, and it's the official full name is The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. Uh, so that's really good. And she's got some YouTube content. So I definitely would recommend grabbing. That is a really thick book, super, super helpful. Not a light, easy read. YouTube might be a YouTube interview, might be a good place to start. Yeah. That's just me. Um, the other one I would recommend um, around personalism, Catholic personalism, is it's called The Personalism of John Henry Newman. And it's by a really great uh, professor, uh, John Crosby. And that's a new book. And John Crosby uh, actually teaches at Franciscan University in Steubenville. And uh, way back when, um, I had the privilege of uh, uh, seeing him give some lectures when I was in Steubenville. So uh, great, great Newman scholar, writes on personalism philosophy himself, and that would just be a fantastic way to get to know personalism and encounter the mind of a great saint through a great Catholic philosopher. Well, Timothy O'Donnell, uh, co-host of the Catholic Cave and a talented man with many, that wears many, many hats. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been a really interesting topic and I, I maybe I won't sleep tonight after listening to all this. <laughs> unplug, uh, unplug your Alexa. Oh yeah, definitely. We, we have it off all the She's time. So. <laughs> hey, thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much for having me on the show.